Hello out there. This is Matt Reddy, host of the Mindful Activist podcast and um, founder of the Global Consensus Project, developer of the HiveOne.net platform. And thank you for joining us today. Let's get this all. Let's see how we're doing here. Facebook Live has got us all. Okay, and you got us. So we're broadcasting today live over Facebook. We're on you now. And uh, we also have a Zoom, a Zoom video conference uh, room set up. So if any of you are daring and you join in, you will appear magically on the screen back here and you can participate in full audio video with today's very exciting episode. It's very exciting for two reasons. It's the first time I had a return guest because technically, Anami. Have I been on this show? Well, before? <laughs> technically, I did interview Anami. I haven't released that uh-huh. interview yet, but um, so you're the first returning guest. And uh, it's also the first time I've had actually two live guests. So um, today with me, uh, Anami, a local activist, and Mallory, also a local activist, returning from Standing Rock, where a lot of stuff is happening right now. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it. Is there anything um, more you'd like to say to just introduce who you are um, before we get into your, the story? For me, I think that's all that's important right now. Okay. Mallory? Um, yeah, I mean, local activist and photographer as well, and that was a big reason as to why, I mean, not a big reason, but <clears throat> it was it helped going there knowing that I could photograph a lot of the stuff that was happening because there's just so much to be seen and to, and people relate a lot with, with pictures. So it was kind of a, a push towards us going. Well, to begin with, when did you go? Um, we went last week and got back so we- Thursday night? Yeah. Late Thursday so we night. were actually, we were only there for a couple days because we're, because of work schedules, we really only had this tiny little bit of time to go. And so it was kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, should, should you go if you can only go for a little while? And the fact is, you know, they need bodies, so yes. If you, even if you can only go for a little bit of time, you, you should, uh, because that helps. But also we wanted to, a lot of people are wanting to go. A lot of people, um, and, and you're kind of going, it's really hard to get information from there and accurate information and, and how to arrive and how do you know what's going on and which roads to take in and which ones you can't take in and which camp do um, you what camp do you go to <laughs> because they say oh you can camp at any of the camps but I mean you can um, but there's just there's it's a very different thing going on at each camp and not very um, yeah very different thing I would say at each of the camps and so what we wanted to do was kind of do some fact finding for people who wanted to go and find out you know like Here's how you can make your journey easier. And when we got there, because Mallory wanted to do her photos, she needed a media pass, and we ended up both getting media passes. And we had gone there, we wanted to bring supplies, and we wanted to help do water runs. We had these plans of how we were gonna help. Mm-hmm. And um, um, it's, uh, we were really, I think, quickly humbled and reminded that the best way to help is to listen to the people that you're trying to help. <laughs> and don't don't think you know. Well, I'm sure they need this, so I'm gonna go do this. Um, uh, it's it's better to. Um, I don't know how to finish that thought, but it, it's, it's it's like, better to take a little bit more time to assess what is needed instead of just jumping in and helping. Because sometimes things that you're doing to help actually become a hindrance if it's not something that's needed. And so since we had these media passes, we were able to talk to a lot of um, coordinators and organizers and um, elders and, and find out, you know, what, what do they want you guys all to know? If you're coming, if you're not able to come, like how can you help? What is actually needed and, and what's not needed? What's actually become somewhat of a problem? So right. that's the information we, we brought back to share with you guys Great. today and every other chance we get. Great. Yeah, that um, before we get into that, it very much reminds me of when I, I went to Hong Kong during the Umbrella uh, Revolution there and went there with all these ideas of what I was going to do. And you get there and you're like, okay, first I need to figure out actually what's happening here, mm-hmm. what's, what people are really doing. And, um, but it also taught me, go there. You know, It's just, mm-hmm. just forget, don't try to think about what you're going to do. 
go there, bring your body there, and opportunities will arise. Exactly. Yeah, you don't have to justify your presence by bringing, you know, I need to bring this truckload of food or else I'm, you know, not really helping when I get there. I won't be welcomed or whatever. And it's, it's with things like that, with things like this, um, being there is really important, especially when it's, you know, when you're standing up for something, trying to say something, the, the sheer numbers of people yeah. saying it. So just the most important thing right now is to is being bodies there, actual physical people there. It's, it's really the biggest gift that yeah. they need right now. We were told that so many different times by elders, um, by media, anybody there that was, you know, they were that was their land, that was where they were from. Um, it was a constant, like, just come, just come, just come. Bodies, 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 bodies is the biggest thing. And you could tell, especially when it came down to that time when you had to go to the front line and stand there. And the sheer, you felt the energy of that sheer amount of people coming together as one and you're singing and you're dancing and you're hugging and laughing and knowing even though there's this potential threat coming your way where you might get arrested, where you might get pepper sprayed, you know, where violence might be enacted on your body, there's still this, I don't know, there's something about that mass amount of people coming together for one cause, peacefully, together. It's, it's a beautiful thing, and, and so the more that they have, the more sheer amount of people, the more that will grow, and the more I feel that it, it helps. It just, it literally helps so much. And we saw the numbers grow. Just within the small amount of time we were there, we saw the numbers growing and growing and growing. And even on the last day we were there, we're like, there was way more people here than the first day, and it was, it was powerful. Yeah. I, I can't imagine. I think as people are finding out what's going on and how how atrociously um, people are being treated by the authorities, it makes people want to go and want to stand up. And yeah, it was just this waves of people coming, and that's that's great. Because um, support people are needed as well, you know, people to work in the kitchens and people to help organize all the donations that are coming and all this stuff. is So, you know, if you... If you have kids or um, if you're an elder and you don't, a lot of elders choose to be on the front line right in the very front um, because if they're going to pepper spray somebody, they, they're, um, you know, hopefully that brings some shame to people that they would pepper spray an elder. It doesn't seem to, but you would think that it should. Um, and so they need those support people, but, but yeah, the people who can actually go up to the front line and be there. And it, in the videos, it, it looks really scary and in places it is when stuff is going on. Uh, but you kind of can choose the level of danger that you feel like you can put yourself in. So if you feel like you need to be safe or you feel like you need to bring your kids or you feel like that there's something about your body that makes it hard for you to be right there on the, the front line, um, if you have something that kind of holds you back from, from full mobility or something, you can um, kind of stay at a support camp and, and do support and support the people that are there at the front line. If you go to the front line, you can be right there at, well, most, mostly it's... Um, Elders, there's there's a lot of women protectors. I mean, if you really want to be right there on the front, I don't think anybody would would deny you. But there's there's several lines of people. Um, they try and have. Uh, if you're going to be on the front line, you have to have nonviolent um, action training. Are um, they providing that? Or do you yeah, just... there's. Uh, if you have if you have nonviolent training, that's great. Um, and because we were media, I think we got kind of skipped around um, that a little bit. But but I believe they have it at the camps that you're. I think everybody's supposed to take their nonviolent training just There's to make sure. There's a meeting that they were having for that because um, they have multiple different kind of meetings mm -hmm. um, for a lot of different things, and that was one of them actually was the nonviolent. They had somebody there, two people. I think there was a group possibly um, that we met in one of our circles, um, and they they came to, to help teach the nonviolence actions. Yeah. So the, I mean, the education is definitely available. Um, and so, so yeah, there's that distancing from the front. You know, you can be right there where you're probably going to get pepper sprayed if something happens. You're probably going to get arrested. You, people have been being beaten by the authorities. People who are completely uh, nonviolent. They have done nothing wrong. They have no weapons, and they're being hands up, and they're being beaten by the police. And um, so you can choose to be there if that's where you need to be. Um, you can be a little bit further back where you you might get some overdraft of pepper spray. They they might come arrest you. They you know, there's, there's lesser chance. And then there's places you can be there where you're right there at the front line, you're a body, you're showing that support, you're, you're the numbers which help, you know, the more people, the safer people are. Um, 
but you have a much less chance of being arrested. And, and the thing is, the numbers helped so much. When we were there, the, the cops, every day they were threatening this raid, uh, the raid that ended up happening Thursday. Um, they, you know, and they were sitting there watching. And so from this side, it's kind of hard to get a lot of um, information. It's an interesting thing when you're in there. Um, but, um, yeah, they kept threatening it. And, and what we know now is that they didn't have the numbers to be able to do the raid. So sheer numbers. They collected cops from all over the place and other states, and then they had enough. And so Thursday, we, we left uh, Wednesday evening um, because of work commitments and some other things that we, we had to come back for. But if we would have known that it was going to be the next day and not like the next week, uh, we would have stayed, I think. Um, but then we wouldn't be on this side with information for you guys because everything went on lockdown and we might not, we yeah. still might not be able they to be here. They blocked anybody up on all roads coming in no in or out and with the cops yeah. blocked people yes. mm-hmm. um when the when the um protectors are doing roadblocks it's only to keep people safe it's only because police are coming in with ak-47s they're coming in with tear gas they're coming in with pepper spray they're coming in to, to tear down um the the stand that's being made on this native land and so um uh that the, those roadblocks are only there to protect people from getting hurt they're not if you if you're trying to drive down 1806 and there is a roadblock from the protectors and you say i'm trying to drive down and they make sure that you don't have weapons and that you're not trying to hurt them they open it open it up and let you through um they're not they're not actually shutting down roadways they're just trying to keep people safe um from a really aggressive force coming in yeah so tell me if you if, if people are thinking I want to go there. Uh, you said that there's a number of different camps. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to like talk about uh, that or how well, do you want to approach that? Was three camps. There's two now. Because um, one was raided. So there originally there was two camps um, originally as well, and then around last week they decided to move up right where the pipeline is supposed to be laid, um, and they called that um, winter camp. And it was kind of to make a stand on that land, on that piece of property, to say, no, you cannot. This is our property. You cannot come and destroy our sacred land and put a pipeline in. Um, and then they had, um, a, a, down the road, they had an actual block, blockade where they were, it was for security-wise, like she was saying. Um, that's the one on Thursday that got raided where they tore the teepees down, um, People had yurts, little tiny yurts, trailers, um, tents, um, kitchens. They made their kitchens, and um, there was a lot of food supply. There, it was, it was a camp. It was a home. It's a literal home for these people, um, especially with winter coming there, and it's, it, you know, it's cold, and they're they're making something so that you could live during the winter in the snow. And so that's what they came and raided and took apart and tore apart. Um, so now it's just the other two camps that are left, which I think a lot of people are at the main camp now. Yeah, I understood it a little differently. Um, and of course everything, you know, it's you're, as you're experiencing it, everybody kind of um, sees things differently. I kind of, uh, in, in my mind, when we arrived, there were four camps. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the original camp, the Sacred Stone Camp, which is on private property, um, on the reservation, is the furthest from the front line. Um, and it's, um, I think, that's the one a lot of people that seem to go to because it's the oldest one. And it has a very, when we got there, we were kind of like, this is not what we were expecting. It, it had a very, the, the intensity definitely increases the closer the camps are to the front line. And, and this one, it seemed, uh, almost very relaxed and people seemed almost like people had like hula hoops and they had like it was just kind of like I don't know it, people seem to be I mean it's great to be there in solidarity and it's a prayer camp so I'm sure people are putting a lot of good energy towards it and they're they're kind of taking most of the donations in and, and trying to organize them which is, has become really difficult because there's kind of a lot of the wrong things um, and so that's kind of what's going on there is that support camp there's there's events and they they talk about um People, people perform and speak and coming up uh, closer, there's Rosebud Camp. This was that little one and that one, I think I think it, by now she's right that this one might be disbanded. They were it's supposed to be, they're condensing because of winter. 
is what he was, um, one of the, the um, elders, I guess you call him Johnny, he was asking for people to come closer in hmm. to the main camp because it, the snow, it's going to snow. Yeah, and I, because the information changes so fast, like, I mean, within 10 minutes, within a half an hour, and we've been gone for a couple days now, who everything could be different. And we've been trying to keep up on what's going on, but it's really hard to keep up to date information. Um, but the, um, the goal I think was to condense camps for winter. And the original plan was winter camp was going to be the main camp because it is right there on the front line. It's right there where the pipeline is supposed to go in, uh, was, um, is right there. And so that was the one they were trying to condense people to. And then, um, Ocheti Sakowin is the big camp or North camp. There's a couple different names for it. And that's the, the really big one that you often see in pictures. Um, Sacred Stone Camp, there's no pictures of that one. Um, they asked that to be that way. Um, so you mostly see the larger camp. And I don't think I have seen pictures of the Rosebud Camp, um, which is kind of between. But they were going to break it down to, I think, two camps, and they hadn't decided. The elders were still um, talking in council about whether that would be Sacred Stone Camp and Winter Camp or Ocheti Sakowin Ocheti Sakowin Camp and Winter Camp. But now that Winter Camp is disbanded, has been, well, we'll get to that part, um, is no longer there. Uh, we don't have a way to know what was decided camp-wise, but just if you if you want to go there and mostly be a support person, you want to be really safe, um, you want to head right for probably Sacred Stone Camp, which is um, the furthest south. If you want to, um, if you if you are in Ocheti Sakowin and there is a frontline action, they somebody will be on that microphone saying, it, it, you need to get to the front line right now, you need to be there now. I heard them say, you, you guys up there on the hill, now. <laughs> Um, there's more of a, I mean, and if you can't, if you have your kids, you, if, you know, if there's a reason why you can't go to the front line, nobody's going to try and make you feel bad for that. But there's definitely, it's more intense and there's more pressure to get there. Like, you know, the relatives are in danger now. Like they, they're, the soldiers are coming in now. You have to get up there and support it. Um, and that's where it's really needed um, is people who can uh, uh, actually go up and stand and, and help provide that safety in numbers. So, well, I mean, for one, just to know that there's, there are these set camps, mm -hmm. I mean, that like gives, like, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, possibly going out there. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are camps, there are, um, where was I going with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and, but it's definitely camping, right? I mean, you need to be, now you need to be prepared for like winter camping. It's still so, in Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like Alaska. So, uh, serious tents or bring your RV. I don't know. You're an camper. RV you can. Right. Summer tents are no good. If you've got a four season tent, an all weather tent, that'll work. Um, they're trying to get these Arctic tents that smaller tents can go inside. They're like 50 yards by 80 yards. They can put the kitchens in them. Oh, they can wow. heat them with wood stoves and you can put your, your even, then you could have a summer tent, but they don't have these Arctic tents yet. So if you only have a summer tent, that's not going to do it. The winds go up to 70 miles an hour. The temperatures will drop to 20 below. Um, there's going to be lots of snow. Um, and so what they're asking, so for those of you that want to go, uh, when you get there, you won't, you can camp anywhere pretty much. If you see a spot and there's not like a, it's obviously not a thoroughfare for people to, to drive, you can camp there, but they're asking that you find people to, to bond in with. Don't be like, well, I kind of like my space, so I'm going to camp over here. Um, the guy said repeatedly, uh, one of the elders at the, at the, meeting was like, if you go off by yourself, you will die. Once it starts, to, it's not, it's, I mean, it, it, it's funny the way I'm saying it, I guess, but it's not. If you go off and nobody knows you're over there and it snows and you can't get back to the camp, you can freeze to death. I mean, it's, um, I'm not trying to discourage anyone from going. I just want people to go prepared, prepared for it to be really cold, uh, prepared for there to be snow, and, and really with that knowledge that you have to be part of the community. You can't, you can't go there and be separate. Um, and you, you'll be welcome. Everyone there is welcomed like their family. The um, sixth generation grandson of Sitting Bull sat there in the meeting um, and was saying, you know, everyone here is native. Every everyone here is um, part of this family. And so when you go there, you will be you will be welcomed. You'll be welcomed to eat food. And you're welcome to to sit and pray at the sacred fire. You're welcome to go and be part of it. They're they're um, not going to make you feel like you want to be exclusionary. So really you want to find there's, there's, um, you know, there's the two spirit camp for LGBT people. If there's, if you want to 
place to dive in and you don't have to be LGBT to camp there, but you know, if you're just like, these are people who will welcome, I'll camp there, you know, or, you know, I, I don't know how you, how you would pick, but find a fire, you know, and be like, I, I would like to camp here with you guys. Can I camp here with you guys and make friends with those people? Um, find, find some place to, to fit in. Don't go and be a satellite. Okay, so I have to like delve in a little tangent just from what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, so there was there was a specific uh, part of a camp or a camp that was more LGBT friendly than another, um, or I mean, not camp to say, fire. Okay, so, a campfire like within within a camp, you mean? Yeah. So the camp okay. is the camp is um, how big would you say that is? Big. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, you don't really realize how big it is until you're coming down. Hundred yards, three hundred yeah. yards across, and it's kind of circular. Right. Um, so um, within that, you know, everybody's got their RVs. There, there's TPs. There's um, meeting tents. There's um, all these different areas within that big camp. Um, and they're like I said, they're trying to get everybody really condensed in so that it's for safety, it's for warmth, it's so that they know how many people are there. That's another thing is like there's no way right now to, because everyone's so spread out, you can't track who's there. So if somebody goes missing and nobody knows to check in with them, how do you know they're missing? Right. Um, and people, people are getting taken by unmarked people in military garb in little buggy things. And for a while when we were there, there, were, um, there was an incident where two people were taken by somebody in military garb on a little buggy. Um, and only one of them was showing up as arrested. And for most of the days we were there, people were panicking. They're like, we know there was this other person. It, well, in fact, all the way up until when the day we left, a lot of people hadn't, hadn't found out what had happened. And so they were kidnapped. They thought they were kidnapped, that one was arrested and one was who knows where. And so having people know who you are and that you plan to be back is really important. Um, that In that situation, it was um, three people were approached, two people were taken, 12 people came up and... I got this from somebody who, who was there, the third person was, who was saying this. Um, Twelve people came up and they, they took that second person and they pushed them off and ended up only arresting the one. So he wasn't actually kidnapped. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that's another really important part. Information is crazy to keep track of out there, I guess. Rumors. So many rumors. Um, it, it, during this, this raid, there was... Um, People on horseback. There was a young boy who, some people say he was 15, some people say he was 18. Uh, his, they were shooting live rounds at the horse riders. They hit some of the horses. Um, this, this young man's horse had to be put down um, because he was shot uh, with an automatic weapon. The horse, not the person. Um, and that story changed to an 11-year-old boy on horseback and his horse were shot. And then eventually it changed, and I heard something about an 11-year-old girl being shot. And killed. And killed. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in truth, no human died. So the horse died, and, and uh, the fact that, I mean, it's, you know, so here they've killed the horse, and so either that's a living being or that's, that's property if you want to go there. Either way, it's... It, it's uh, not appropriate, but beyond that, if you shoot the horse out from under somebody and they fall and break their neck, that's, I mean, this, these, these police and these soldiers, these National Guard are, um, are attempting murder and, and not even just a little bit, but a lot. Yeah. Um, they're saying things, you know, there was this woman who, um, they said had a 38 and was firing at cops. I don't know if you guys have I kept heard, up I on heard the something morning. about that. It is. You can First. see it in the in the videos. It's a prayer stick with a dream catcher on top that they had carried this whole way, and she was down in the front with this prayer stick. It's an elder. She's this small woman armed only with prayer and a prayer stick, and you there's pictures of them ripping the prayer stick out of her hand and hitting her in the stomach with a metal baton, and the fact that they would do this to people and then have the, the unconscionable action to go on to their site and say that she was shooting at them with a 38. We, we saw no weapons when we were there, not a single one. Nope. They said they had to pepper spray people because they were shooting bows and arrows. There's no bows. There's no arrows. And like, that's, I mean, like super like, <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, I, I guess it's racist because they're saying that because they're like they're native peoples. So they're shooting at us with bows and arrows. Like the stereotyping. It's a uh, stereotyping. Yeah. And, but yeah. <laughs> there are no weapons in the camps. They even ask people not to bring large knives that are for camping purposes because they might be perceived to be weapons. And nobody preaches anything other than nonviolence. And the only thing even stemming towards um, that sort of attitude from the natives that we heard were from warriors at the front lines who were saying that if they had to, they would lay down in front of those tanks and die if they had to. They're not talking about going out and hurting the officers or hurting the soldiers. They're talking about putting their lives on the line to stop them. And that's the, the closest thing to violence that we heard out of any of these people. And in fact, they, when in discussion of the police, um, it, everybody's, there's a always constant reminder of these are people. They are the same as us. Remember that. They have families. They have lives. They're doing their job. They don't know any better. And it's, it's sympathize with them, you know, and, and, and try to connect with them on, on a human level um, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, calling them evil or saying anything that's negative in any way towards them. They try to be as loving and as peaceful as they possibly can. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Even knowing that what they have they do to them. There was a teenage girl that we got to talk to um, and see um, and see in the north, um, the winter camp. She had her arm broken by one of the police in a riot, <clears throat> and on Thursday, they in a raid. In a raid, excuse me, in a raid. Um, they saw her and saw that she had a cast on from it being broken, and they rebroke it. And even after that, a teenage girl, even after that, there's still compassion and there's still just love <laughs> and, and trying to, uh, to understand them as people as well. And it's, it's profound. It's like it really hits you deep is seeing that, seeing the fact that they can just let it all go. And, and that girl went back to the front line and then after it was rebroken, she went back to the front line again. Like you, yeah. there's no, <sighs> there's no giving up there's no there's no okay never mind let them put in the pipeline <laughs> there's no um and you guys probably noticed that i i i don't it's like i don't want to correct but language is is important and easy to confuse and so the police keep saying well they were rioting they were rioting and so uh to be really clear that's you know the police are raiding they're saying they're raiding because of riots there are no riots the the natives have not um Native people and protectors, um, uh, all the protectors, sorry that came out odd, um, have not, um, uh, there's no Molotov cocktails, that's one that we've heard. There's, there's so much misinformation being put out there. There's so many rumors from inside. We, we were there when we, um, Obama had a, a meeting with, it was a chairman from one of the tribes, um, and I can't remember which. Archibald was it the one from the Sioux Nation? It might have been. It was on Wednesday, I believe. It was on Wednesday, yeah. and so we're 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 there, and an elder came out and and said he said they have to stop. He said they have to stop the pipeline. Uh, they can't they can't do it anymore. Yay! And everybody cheered, and everybody got really happy. But they also were like, hmm, are we sure? <laughs> are we sure? And and it wasn't until uh, I think until we got back that we found out he did in fact ask them again to stop. He did not give them a directive that they have to stop. He asked them to stop. They've been asked to stop now by the President of the United States, the Department of Justice, uh, the United Nations, to my understanding, which I'm still trying to get some more ver verification on that, but the United Nations was on the phone when we were in the media tent. Yeah. Um, wow. all, all, all across the world, <laughs> people are trying to get this corporation to stop, and they were refusing to stop. Mm -hmm. So Thursday, what happened during this raid was they came in uh, with hundreds of officers, with army tanks, with AK-47s, with silencers on them. They're, they're um, attacking people, they're beating people, they're spraying with mace, they use concussion grenades. Um, they came in, they took the, um, they stomped on all of the sacred items that were at the front line as they came in. As we were saying, they ripped the prayer staff out of the elders' hands. They went to the sweat lodge, which is the church. This is the church. And they pulled it open. They pulled out elders who were in prayer while they were in prayer um, and tore it down. And then they destroyed the sacred fire. And this is like somebody just, 
you know, for, for those of you out there that, that go to a church of any kind, imagine armed soldiers coming into your church while you're praying and ripping you out and beating you and macing you and then arresting you for rioting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's just un, unconscionable <laughs> what is happening to people who are just trying to... It's a, it's a pipeline that's being protested all the way from uh, um, Canada, all the way down to where it goes. It's going to carry 550,000 gallons, uh, or barrels, sorry, 550, that's much more than gallons, 550,000 barrels of oil a day from the Balkan oil fields, which already does not need to have any more oil taken out of it. I mean, we're, we're unstabilizing the earth as it is by pulling all of this stuff out. Um, they're rushing to build something that already potentially could be leak, leak have leaks and, and, and poison the water. And the fact that they're working at night, building it in a hurry even more so. Yeah, and it's not even the potential for it. There was yeah. 272 leaks on these pipelines by this company in that state alone. 272 in that state alone already. Um, leaks from their pipeline and now yeah they're they're angry they're having to, to work through people that are opposing them and uh, they're not doing a good job they're not exactly doing a better job because of all this they're probably doing a worse job because of this and then you could hear them at night when like in a, you're trying to sleep in the camp and you could literally hear the tractors and the it literally it sounds like a construction site. You it is. Hear, yeah. It is a construction. You hear it, and you hear it constantly throughout the night and into the early morning. Um, I don't know how many people they have working there and the shifts that go, but you know those people are probably tired and they're not doing a good job. Yeah, on and top of that, in dark and at night. Mm -hmm. And they they came in and they took so that winter camp that was up there maybe I don't say a hundred yards from from. The, the place where they try and stop people from coming in and then down is the was the winter camp which is uh, I think it, most people know about the company bringing the dogs and the day that happened so across the street from where the camp was uh, is sacred ground there's artifacts there there's burial grounds there this is sacred native land with <laughs> every reason not to dig it up and they, they were coming down, and, and the, um, the protectors were there stopping them. And that's when they brought the dogs and attacked people. And this pushed people back, and that's when they, they just, even though there was a stop worker, even though there was an injunction, a, a federal injunction, they continued construction all the way up to the road. So um, I, should have, I should have brought pictures of this. So, yeah, you can see um, the dirt all pushed up to that fence. Then there's 1806, and on the other side was the camp. So where they want to come right through next and dig, that's where the camp was. And so they came in with this military action. Um, and and I've, I've never, you know, it's um, it's like they're, they're waging war. They're waging war on people to put this pipeline in. And they came in and they, they arrested everyone. They beat people. They sprayed <coughs> people. They, they pushed them all back. And they kept being like, we'd like you to go to the south camp. You'll be safe if you go south to the other camp, you know. And they, they sound like they're... <coughs> They're being all like making it possible to avoid arrest, which first of all, then you'd have to give up to for that. But also they're like, if you go to your car and drive away, we won't stop you. And then people were saying, but they were stopping us. They're saying that out loud. And pepper sprayed. And then they were getting pepper sprayed and their keys were being taken, even though they were actively trying to leave and actively trying to follow the orders of the police, those, those particular people. Um, they were still stopped from doing so, even though the police were saying they would be safe and would be allowed to go. They were not. Um, and so that everybody got pushed back and the, they, they, um, they were bringing their, their trucks down the road and their trucks had some wiring difficulties and they were stuck there in the road, which stopped them from coming further down. And so <coughs> that was, uh, uh, in between the, uh, Ocheti Sakawin camp and that winter camp place. Um, so once they cleared all that, they cleared all the teepees and the yurts and the trailers and the tents and all of the stuff that people had built there to, to stop this from happening. And the, on the live feed, it's night and you can hear the construction working. So I was trying to find out before I came here, like, what does that look like now? What does that place at winter camp look like now? Is it all dug up? Is it like, <laughs> like across the street where like you, you can't go backwards on this stuff. You can't, you can't undig up a grave, you know? Um, so, and I wasn't able to find out for you guys, I'm sorry, I wanted to, to find out if there, if anybody knows, but there, 
uh, I mean, they're, they're coming at people with wide rounds of ammunition. Um, so people are kind of, uh, kind of stuck lower. And really the only thing at this point that can, that can, that's not true. I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> One thing I think that could probably stop this more than other things is if 10,000 people show up, you know, and yeah. walk up there and, and get in the way again. There's, um, uh, the the pipeline is laid uh, as of Wednesday, 4.30 Wednesday, 1.88 miles from, was it from the river or from the camp? Ooh, I, I want to say it was from, from the river, so where they're trying to go under. Um, they don't have an Army Corps of Engineer permit to go under the river at this time. This company, <laughs> well, we can go into that next, I guess, how exactly illegal the company is. I, yeah, I was going to say that you should probably clarify because there's a yeah. lot of um, questions out there about whether or not who's in the right and who's in the wrong. Whose land it is. Um, whose land it actually is. And yeah. she actually has that information. We got that actually from uh, legal. So so this is um, verified through several sources. We got this information from media. We got this information from elders. We got this information from the legal um, uh, contingent there. Um, they're called... Red, I have it written down somewhere, red, red rose legal, red cedar legal, something. Anyway, um, red wing legal? <laughs> I, it's in my notes somewhere. It's but anyway, legal. The, the legal that's <laughs> handling um, every, everybody's arrest yeah. and, and also, you know, how, how to fight this in other ways. So in um, 1851, um, I, I've seen on the, on the news they say 1861, but that's a different tribe's treaty that's similar but different. So in 1851, the Fort Laramie Treaty gave a certain set of land as the reservation to the Sioux Nation. Um, um, let me show you. <laughs> Here this is. I have pulled this up for you guys. Um, so um, we'll see. Right, I'm going to have to get cool. Do you want me to bring it to <laughs> the... <laughs> um, let's see, yeah. Well, at least for Facebook Live, we'll give them... Yeah, all right. I mean, I can hold it up there. Um, I have a couple other maps clear for us who don't know North Dakota really well. Um, so this is the Black Hills, which we've had this sort of problem before with the Black Hills gold um, in the 80s. Uh, but this was this was what is set aside by the treaty. It goes all the way up here to the Hart River, and so I've got another uh, map with the with the modern towns on it, so you can see where that is. Um, Um, so this one, oh, here, I'll fix it. Okay. yeah, this one's kind of, <laughs> this one's kind of small, sorry, but you can see where Bismarck is up here. So the Hart River is, is up here by Bismarck. So, um, and we're talking about this area way down here. So they're not trying to say that they want to reclaim all the land up to Bismarck, but they're saying that as far as putting pipelines in the ground and destroying the water supply, um, that that is that is treated land. That is their land. Um, huh. And is that alternate pipeline route? Is that like uh, what they the tribe would prefer them? To no, that's do? the other option that they didn't do. This it, it was possible. This pipeline is horrible wherever it goes. Yeah. Uh, but they could have put a place where it would go under less water, and. Uh, it would go around the reservation, and they they chose not to do that route uh, for whatever reason. I don't. I don't Money know. probably, but it's it's interesting that they they had an option. I mean, when if we can pause just for to give you a little like a reflection from what I, what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, I mean, if you look at this like it's a it's a it's a conflict of two forces. You know, the the forces that want to do the, the pipeline. And the forces that don't, and you hope um, if you want the uh, the protectors, the people that want to protect the water, to win, you hope at some point you can start a negotiation, uh, a national negotiation, that both sides will you know a peace, I mean, a new treaty. Well, I, ideally, sort. but but in order for that to happen, the the um, uh, the energy partners, the corporation, 
uh, would it would have to act civilized. Somebody from that sure. company would have to act like a human being, and none of them are. So well, or they'd have to be forced to by a third party of force, like the U.S. government could potentially. Well, the U.S. government has. The Department of Justice has told them this off. They don't have an Army Corps of Engineer permit for this area, even if they did have legal right to come through here. They haven't got the permit. But but if the U.S. government actually wanted them to stop, I mean, it's like then you send in the, the National Guard to enforce the law. That's what we did during the Civil Rights Movement when we wanted to integrate the schools. The government ha you know, has to use its might to enforce, uh, well, if to enforce a, whatever, a, a treaty or peace right, but is. That's, but that's, it's not happening. No, I, it is. The National Guard is there. They're just fighting on the wrong side. Yes, I hear you. They're, <laughs> like, <laughs> they're there. They're just not... I, I, it totally blows my mind that they're because it, because it gets it gets more complex than that because it's not even just well you know in 1851 this land was treated because in 1873 a lot of this land the, the line was moved back the line was moved all the way back to where um, Ochechi Sakowin camp is and that's why they're claiming that they have this land so um, what happened was um, in 1873 as as this happened with a lot of treaties they're like you can have this much land. Oh, no, wait, actually, we, we want you to have less than that. We want, we're going to take more. And they just yeah. took it. Um, I think that's how most treaties have gone forever. Yes. Uh, with, with the U.S. And <laughs> In fact, I believe people. all of them yeah. have yeah. been um, backed on. So um, at, at that time, this, this land was tracted as farmland, and it's been through a series of ownerships. So um, most recently, there was a farmer that owned this land. Uh, and he sold the land to the Dakota Access Pipeline to go through. And this is why people say, well, it's private property that belongs to the DAPL. So here's the other side of that is that in North Dakota, according to, <laughs> hold on, I'll give you the statute. Um, it's going to load up. Um, it's, uh, I'll have to find it for you. There, there's a statute in the North Dakota law that states that corporations, I have so many resources to show you guys that I can't find this. Here it is. Okay, in chapter 10-06.1 uh, of the North Dakota state law, uh, it's, it states that corporations cannot own and cannot lease, uh, it was a little longer than I thought, so I won't read it to you, but you can look it up. It's, um, they cannot own or lease land. So at the point that they tried to make this sale, um, that contract was null and void because it is illegal. You can't make a non you can't you can't make a contract that is not legal and have it be legally binding. So at that point, the the land re reverted back to ownership of that farmer who had sold it to the DAPL because the sale cannot legally go through. Now that farmer has since decided that the Sioux Nation is in the right, that it is their land, and he would like to uh, uh, give the land back. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's not his to give yeah. back, but you know he yeah. he. He uh, agrees that it is theirs and that, <laughs> yeah, for lack of a better word, he has given the land back. He also uh, turned back over 30, um, 30 buffalo as well mm. uh, because those uh, buffalo live on the land and they belong. Which, I, are, are they the same buffalo that we saw? Some of the buffalo that we saw. So, so yeah. and a lot, some of you know that in the middle of, of the raid that the police were doing, hundreds of buffalo um, Tatanka <laughs> came down the hill and and rushed down on the on the police who who they ran at them and kind of made them run the other way. But um, you know, a lot of people consider this a sign from the Great Spirit because the buffalo represent um, they're a sacred uh, representation of the power of the the Creator. And so, whatever you want to, you know, we'll talk about this in the other podcast. <laughs> whatever you want to, whatever you want to call that thing that's that's bigger than yourself, and um, that they that they came through. And so this this farmer had thirty of those buffalo that really belonged to the land and to the stewardship of of the Sioux tribe, and he also returned those. So, according to treaty law, which is the supreme law of the land and cannot be superseded, um, according to modern day state law. Um, the DAPL has no right or access or ownership of this land. And so a lot of people are like, well, I don't know what they expect. Of course, they're going to get, you know, maced and arrested if they're on private property trying to stop a, a legitimate business thing. This is not a legitimate. In fact, they're the ones that are trespassing and mm -hmm. are on property that are, is not theirs. 
Mm. Yeah, and it's and that's the thing. Yeah, it's clear. It's clear in these two really defined, easy to see and under. I mean, you can read the Fort Laramie Treaty and see it for yourself that it's theirs. You can uh, read this law for yourself and see that it's not possible for it to be. Um, Every time I try and talk about it, I forget that it's something, something, energy partners. This this corporation that's putting in the pipeline, they um, have absolutely no legal right to be there doing this. And the fact that uh, we're in a, supposedly a free country and we're supposedly, um, you know, citizens of this place and the government, you know, supposedly represents us and works for us. Um, but the fact that it's going to come in and um, allow this pipeline that... This, this river, this is the Missouri River. This is um, the North Dakota part of the Missouri River. So every part of the Missouri River below will be tainted by this oil if this pipeline goes in. On top of that, 62, 67. I think it's, okay, either 62 or 67 percent. Again, I'd have to refer to my notes for the exact number, but more than 60 percent of South Dakota's potable water comes from this river, comes from this water source. And so this isn't just uh, um, the water for um, the people that live there on the reservation. This is like almost all of South Dakota's water as well. Not all, okay, over half. I'm sorry if I'm exaggerating a little bit. It is over half of South Dakota's water as well. So, um, I'm just thinking about, uh, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that will like question the, uh, the, legal, the legal question. And, um, for what it's worth, if I was like sitting in a, the jury box and you know, there was, I mean, my perspective is that, um, I mean, corporations have been uh, rewriting the laws to their benefit for as long as they've existed. I mean, um, and it's a problem across the country, corporations doing uh, fracking and doing other things that are, um, you know, just uh, mining water or whatever. Um, they're doing things all over the country that are threatening water supplies, threatening the health of communities. They've destroyed it. They're not even threatening it. Yeah. Like there's places in Colorado they've done fracking that people have had to be trucking in water since the nineties. Yeah. You know, they used to have they used to be able to have their well and get their water and, and now they have to drive, you know, with big big tanks and go fill up water because these oil and gas companies have come and and shot the ground full of toxic chemicals that get in the groundwater. I mean this, this, that's what, and that's one of the reasons this is a much bigger fight than just um, this is treaty land that belongs to these Native American people and it's being taken back by the government for this corporation. It goes beyond that too because this is martial law being enacted on citizens for trying to have water to drink. And if we anywhere in the United States want to have water to drink, you know, which in case anybody's not aware, you need that to survive. Um, this affects us all, and if they if they get away with this, it's it's another set precedent that they can get away with this. And so everybody who can possibly go stop this thing, you're you're standing up for the right to have clean water everywhere in the United States, not just for South Dakota and the North Dakota uh, Sioux Nation. I I'd, I'd, I'd put it even. You're standing up for the right for people who live in an area to have the right to say what is healthy and safe yeah. in their community as versus just corporate money. Yeah. You know, this is really, this is corporations just doing what they want to do because it helps them make money. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, uh, we have this, I mean, we have this strange history of saying corporations are people, you know, that they somehow have like equal rights to human beings, but they are, you know, and I actually got in trouble during my campaign for writing on my blog that I thought corporations were evil monsters. It got like got this huge article in the in the paper about it, but it was like they are they're sociopathic entities. Yeah. They have one priority: money, money. and so they're yeah. threatening. They'll threaten anything to milk it for mm -hmm. money, and they will use force. They will use you know the law. They will use whatever level of force they can to just to make more money. Yeah. It's it's completely neurotic. And so this is this is the this is the front line point of the edge of the fight of human rights versus corporate rights. Yeah. yeah. And it will um the and right I agree with you. To I, I just this. Yeah. <laughs> and, simple, clean, healthy water. And this, so I, I wanna I wanna say I completely support and, and honor your guys' going there. Um and I totally agree with them. 
I, I posted on my Facebook the other day, we, they need about another 10,000 people in Standing Rock. You need to flood Standing yeah. Rock like they flooded Tahir Square, like every, I mean, a nonviolent revolution, a nonviolent protest only works with mass numbers because they mm -hmm. will use force, but once they, the force is overwhelmed uh, with numbers, it becomes incredibly awkward and shameful for them to continue to use the force. Well, and, and they physically can't. Like for when we were there, they didn't have enough people. There were uh, maybe, I'm gonna guess about 500 people up there at the frontline camp, the winter camp. Uh, about 2,000 people probably total in all the camps. This is a really wild guess. Don't take that number as a fact. Um, they didn't have enough people to, to handle that. So, you know, let's double that. Let's triple that. Um, this company also is in Dallas, Texas, this corporation. They don't care about the Missouri River. They're not getting their drinking water there. There's no one that works for this company that, that gives any any thought well, or care they to would, it. They actually would say, that the administrators of the company would say, they their job is to make money for their shareholders. So they'd actually say it's their job to have no moral interest in the health mm -hmm. of that okay. community. It's a... Uh, um, I mean, it's, it's a neurosis. <laughs> it's a neurosis in our country. We yeah. have to figure out how to take these corporations and put them in a little safety box where they can behave under our human guidelines and not allow corporations to direct our military and police to beat up our own citizens for protecting their homes. This is yeah. completely backwards. It's, and if you want to go, here's the name, if you want to go to Energy Transfer Partners at 8111 Winchester Drive in Dallas, Texas, um, that would be great too. Like, if you're in Texas and you have a problem with this, um, go there, 811 Winchester Drive, Dallas, Texas, um, and, and tell them in person. Tell them, you know, this is one of those things that's, you know, you can't ignore, uh, what do they say, if you if you go and die on someone's doorstep, they can't ignore you because you're going to rot there. Go, go to their doorstep. Go sit there. If you can't stand in North Dakota and you're in the Texas area, go to their offices and sit there and... Make a stand there, make a stand anywhere that you, if you can't come here, you can make a stand from where you are. You can also call the North Dakota governor, Jack Derrymple, who has sent in the National Guard and is authorizing Morton County sheriffs to um, do this action. Um, I, have all these, I'd really like Go to share it. these phone sure. numbers. I can either show them to you guys or tell you. you can, get you get can, a pen oh, and paper, everybody. Oh, I can, <laughs> uh, do you want me to we, bring the camera I, or you um, just want to read some? Whatever we think is... I, we can do both. Yeah, let's do both. Let's, We're gonna do both. Let's show and um, and actually I have two pages of numbers. This is because I I thought I should be called and other people thought others should be called. So call them all. Call them every day. See what we got. Um, so North Dakota Governor Jack Derrymple seven zero one three two eight two two zero zero. Uh, you can call the White House and lodge a complaint two zero two four five six one 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 one. Uh, the Department of Justice is 202-514-2000. Morton County Sheriff, or as they're listed on Google now, Morton County Criminals, 701-667-3330. Um, North Dakota National Guard uh, is 701-333-2000. Um, and Energy Transfer Partners is 214-981-0700. You can also reach, um, I think that first number is their media person. The second number is their, another person I thought was, was reasonable to contact, and I can't remember who it is right now, 214-599-8785. That's the corporation. That's the corporation that's putting in the pipeline. Um, some people have asked, what do we say when we call? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just, just tell them. What you are doing is illegal, and you are not, uh, I, I'm asking for you to not do it. You know, what you're doing to the Sioux Nation is illegal. This is their land, and you need to stop trying to put a pipeline through it. Um, just tell them that. Um, hold on, because there's more numbers. <laughs> Let me get the other page. Do you want me to bring the camera over, and we'll show them again? I can bring the computer there if you I don't think. I don't think that's uh, easier. <laughs> okay. Um... Sorry, let me pull up the file here. Sure. Um, a couple people have uh, said thank you for for being here and doing this. And... So we're just hoping that we can help however we can. Yeah. Um, so the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, right now, the Army Corps of Engineers is 
fairly supporting the Sioux Nation. Um, they have given a permit for um, Ochetisakawin is if you know if it's not tribal land, it's Army Corps of Engineer land that particular part, and they have given a permit for that camp to be there. So they're showing support in that way. They also have not authorized the permit for the pipeline to go under the Missouri River. Um, so calling them and telling them you don't think it should go under the Missouri River is a really good idea. Um, and this is all about trying to get an environmental impact statement from the Army Corps of Engineers that says it's okay to do this. You know, it says they're not going to find a bunch of artifacts. They're not going to find a bunch of that. They're not going to find a burial ground that there are not unique. Um, that was one of the reports I read from the Army Corps of Engineers that that there is potentially unique rock formations in the area that would be destroyed and could never exist again. And there, you know, there's there's a lot of reasons. Plus the environmental impact of it going under the river and the potential for for all that drinking water. So, um, um, call the call the Army Corps of Engineers um, and ask them to rescind the the permits that they have issued and to not issue any more. And that is two zero two seven six one five nine zero three. Um, if you want to donate money, there's a lot of, actually, uh, let me cross that off. Actually, <laughs> yeah, uh, for these, um, do not donate to the, <laughs> wow, I didn't even notice this was around there. Do not donate to any GoFundMes. Do not donate to fundraisers. Do not donate to, a lot of people are abusing this sure. and setting up GoFundMes and that money, maybe it gets to the camps, maybe it doesn't. You can go to sacredstonecamp.org. Um, from there, you can donate um, directly to Sacred Stone Camp, which in theory, they're distributing that money out beyond that one camp. But mm -hmm. at least that way, it's going actually to Standing Rock. Mm -hmm. The legal defense I'll get to on that page. Um, you can go to um, indigenousrising.org. Those donations also go right to it. Um, maybe these other GoFundMes, or maybe when you buy a, a, a no DAPL t-shirt, maybe that money goes there, but it might not. And so it, just send it right, right to them. Um, that way there's, there's not a chance that somebody is, uh, making money off of this atrocity. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so, um, oh, now a few more numbers. So these are, these are the, um, vice president, the executive vice president and the lead analyst at Energy Transfer Partners. Um, Lee Hans, uh, the um, Executive Vice President, 210-403-6455. Uh, Glenn Emery, he's the Vice President, 210-403-6762. And the lead uh, analyst is 71, his name is Michael Walters, 713-989-2404. Um, yeah, make it part of your daily routine, you know, get up. Put, put some thoughts, if you if you pray, if you meditate, if you're an atheist, then you just wish good thoughts. You know, however you send that energy to them, wake up, send that energy, and then call these people. Just go down the list and, and say your bit to each one. And then the next day when you wake up, call them back again. And you'll probably get busy signals, and that's great. That means so many people are calling. Um, if you have time, keep calling, you know, keep those lines jammed up so they can't, you know. You can even write letters as well. Is you can it write letters, send emails. Been doing this writing letters to the White House and to yeah. the governor as well of North Dakota, and that's been, you know, raining in. Yeah, Just, and I would say, in you know, in a case like this, uh, probably actual letters, paper letters, because it takes up space, it takes up, it clogs up their, you know, the, their mailbox, so they have to carry it, mm -hmm. you know, it's a... Uh, um, what I, what I often tell people when it's in terms of activism, it's literally, you can just like measure how much effort did it take. You know, an mm -hmm. email takes a few seconds, that's about the level of impact it'll have a few seconds. But yes. if you write a letter, you know, it has to be carried there, there's energy, it has like, yes. that's, that's a that's very good point. That. Yeah. So then same thing with money, you know, money is one thing, but, you know, do something, go to, you know, organize a group or a protest or go to yeah. a protest or march in yeah. solidarity in some, yeah. mm -hmm. in whatever city you're in. But the, the, tell, the ultimate tell, one is And to tell get there. people. Tell right. people about it. I met somebody yesterday that has n no idea that this is going on. This, they don't know that Standing Rock is a place. They don't know that there's a pipeline going in. They don't know that there's people opposing it. So the mainstream media is just barely starting to pick this up a little bit right now. People don't know still. So yeah. tell people, tell people, tell people. Put it, um, put it on your Facebook. Those of you that are also mutual friends of mine, you've seen my Facebook has been pretty kind of bombarding you guys lately because I want to make sure that everyone knows this is happening so that if you um, 
so you can do something about it. Whatever it is you're able to do. If you can go there, if you can go to something in your hometown to stand up about it, if you can make these calls. Um, on yeah. that note, <laughs> tonight at 7 p.m., uh, there's an international uh, vigil for Standing Rock. It's uh, play locations all over the world at the same time. 7 p.m. Pacific time? For us here in Pacific okay. time, uh, here in Port Townsend, it'll be at 7 p.m., and it's going to be at the, um, uh, the Point Hudson Beach. So uh, down there around that Point Hudson Marina, um, kind of near docks in Shanghai and that um, campground there, um, right on the beach there, um, look for people with candles. I imagine yeah. you'll. <laughs> and it's worth it. It's, I mean, even whether or not this is something that y you relate to is with water or um, or seeing how people are being abused in this way. I mean, it's it's a huge thing being there and connecting and actually like you go, you know, before you go the mindset and what's happening, but until you actually are there, you don't. It changes you it completely. Mm -hmm. The people that you get to know that are such loving human beings and just full of, of laughter and love. There is one point where we're at a blockade and they're waiting for the police to come up and we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting and a bunch of teenage boys got out a hacky sack and just started playing the hacky sack in the rope because, and there's still laughter going on and it's just, you get to know these people and it changes you and then, and then to see them once you've left and see them being abused and, and, and hurt violently it, it it really gets you inside so I mean think about if it was a friend of yours there or a daughter or a son or a mom or a dad or aunt or uncle anybody or grandmother or grandfather anybody that you can connect to that relates to you and you would see that happening to them it's that much more reason to to, to help and to to do anything that you that you can because yeah it's it's heartbreaking yeah, I, um, it is, I, I would be, the way I relate to this, it just is reminding me of when I went to Hong Kong. It's, you don't know what it's like until you're, you're with the people that are, that are, that are on the front lines struggling for their rights. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's one thing to see something on TV, to see someone mm -hmm. get hurt standing up and fighting for their rights and being, not, it's another thing to be standing there. Even if you're just being a witness to it. You are affected by the energy of it in ways you'll never you'll, you'll never know until you've been there, and and you'll realize you have such power. You know, it's you have the power to when you're standing there and someone is getting assaulted um, uh, or or having force used against them while they are peacefully just trying to to stand be for what's right. You realize you could actually just move your body and potentially help that person just by possibly being in the way and it's yeah. it's like that's our it's an ultimate power and it's like we I mean it's almost like as a society we need to learn this this power of our bodies is incredibly important it's not just for the alpha males of our society to, to use force and to it's it's we have to realize everyone has the power of, we are a presence. force yes. each one of us yeah. um, your uh, lies is snagged maybe or no oh. that's a uh, wow I didn't even so funny, I never even plugged in the power for this. This could have gone. I actually was watching a video today um, that somebody made it about Standing Rock, about them going there to give hugs to mm -hmm. everybody. And it's because it, you see it and it just it gets you and, and the woman speaking in it and everything that she's saying. And then even seeing people that you recognize too that we we met while we were there. And then there was one point where they're showing in the video and this is about the power of your body and being there just to stand in for somebody. Um, it, it, the police were pepper spraying um, a man and you could just tell that he was just like, he couldn't see, he was lost. Like there, he didn't know what to do because he was so confused. And you see this other man come in and just take him and swoop him in and get it in his face just to save this other guy. And it literally, I, I just tears because I mean just the, that he knew he was gonna get pepper sprayed but he went in to help another person and it was I it just yeah it's huge that energy and that's that energy there <laughs> yeah the the woman who we, we've talked about earlier who you know they claimed she had a gun but she had a prayer staff that was taken away and she was beaten for them to get to her she um, 
she was in the center of a whole bunch of, of people um, crowded around her, protecting her. And the, the police, in order to get to her, had to pull each one of these people off and arrest her. And they were all willing to, to be in the way because, you know, having that uh, prayer stuff there is a part of their prayer that they're putting there and as a part of trying to stop it in that way and with that energy. And, and they were all there defending that part of it. Yeah, is everybody uh, coming in together to defend each other and to defend the idea and to defend the, the, the sacred objects, which the whole place is a sacred object that is trying to be defended. It's just, um, yeah, watching people put themselves in danger to help somebody else. You even hear it too. We, uh, we talked to one elder, um, her name was, Su um, not Sue, um, um, excuse me. Um, I think Joy, Joy is a name that you. we can yes. share, but some other Joy. names um, to share. Um, she, we talked to her a lot and she was always every day at the front line right there mm -hmm. ready and she would tell us that I'm, I'm gonna stand here I'm gonna stand here through the all day through the night and um, if I have to be the first taken I'll be the first taken and she said but I'm standing here not only for our rights and for our land, but for my people and for the future generation, for my grandkids and the kids that, you know, who are going to learn from this and see this. And it was such a powerful thing just hearing her say that. And, and, and she was just a, a force. And you could tell that everybody there respected her because of that. And her being at the front line and they, they took care of her and they'd come up and you could see them just holding her and her holding them and just this emotional bond and connection and it was it was it was amazing and if she needed anything here here comes a seat uh, a chair so she could still be at the front line and to, you know take a break and sit there but still physically be there and um she needed a sweater or a blanket and it was just it's, it's amazing that, that that um that bond and um and um, the connection and the support, it's massive. I guess uh, one more thing to, for anyone out there wondering about going to a protest area like this, um, it is, it, I, it, my experience, it, it is extra powerful when elders, women, and children, um, young people, you know, uh, it's, uh, Again, it changes the dynamic with the alpha male force that's coming down when they see... Or it should. It's, well, and it should. In this, in this instance, it has not. They're it's not true. being more gentle because there's uh, you know, elders there. They're not being more, more gentle because it's a line of grandmamas right there. You know, they're, not, they're beating them and spraying them in the face with mace. They're like... <laughs> little old ladies, people. They're spraying little old ladies with mace. Like, it's uh, unconscionable. Sound weapons. They're, they've got... It's just... Sorry. It's just... Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, and on that note, if you are going, um, don't forget goggles, um, a respirator. These will help keep the mace out of your face. If you're going to go to the front lines. Uh, whether or not... I would say whether or not you go. We... Yeah. We were going to go and get information for everybody. We didn't really have any intention of going to the front line. Um, it's really hard not to go up there and stand with these people. <laughs> Especially when they're calling on the speaker phones. Get, get up there now! Get up there! Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and then once you're there, it's really hard to leave. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really hard to want to be... Just rips that You want to be right up front standing with everybody else because they're standing up there standing with each other and you just you want to help. Help? <laughs> anyway, um... Yeah, and, and it's just because it's good to have, and if you don't need it, you can send it with somebody, you know, like if you're if you're like, well, I'm going back down to the support camp, and I'm not going to be right here right now, <laughs> take this equipment. So you need earplugs for the LRAD, you need goggles, and a respirator for the mace, and that uh, is, is probably really helpful. This was something that totally slipped my mind when I was packing, and as you were sitting there, uh, waiting for the cops, I was like, uh, and everybody's putting in their earplugs, and I'm like, this is something we yeah. probably should not have forgotten. <laughs> yeah. uh, also, um, a pin, or I'm, many people have it, but just in case, because they do yell out the number for the their legal lawyer there, and you write it on your body um, while you're waiting <laughs> there. This case woman yells it, it, repeats it, yells it, repeats it. <laughs> Normally, there's people handing pins around, but just in case, it's always nice because you don't know. A you sharpie know. for right on your arm. Yeah, exactly. and if because if you do get arrested, their legal defense come, the defense group will come to your defense, 
Um, there is not always money to pay all bails. So you might have to pay your own bail. So again, if you want to help, um, and like right now, 117 people just got arrested and a lot of those people probably don't have that $500 that gets them out of jail. So, um, you know, if you, if you have that and you can bail somebody out or you can donate to the legal defense fund so they can bail people out, um, please do that. But, but that's the thing, like, um, the protectors have each other's back and if you go there, you're a protector and they have your back, you know? So, um, there's, there's things to help, um, uh, mitigate that risk, you know? It, well, we are, we, we, we're at, I think we're at. 15 minutes past the time we said we would stop. Yes. So, uh, and you have to go. Is there anything, last thing you want to say before? Uh, I, I just want to run through our bullet points and make sure we covered everything. Like we got back and we said, what's the most important things we need to make sure everybody knows? And so I just want to run through and make sure that we've covered all those with you. Um, oh. Oh, we probably a car dealer, right? <laughs> um, I actually drove myself, but yeah. Yeah, did you want to say, if you have to go, um, do you want to say anything yeah, before just, I cover this stuff? Um, if you stuff. can go and be a body, please do. Um, if not, support in any way you can and spread it like wildfire. Like, really put it out there. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, any social media that you're on, put it out there. And also make sure it's the right information that you're sharing, the mm -hmm. right accurate information. That's the biggest thing because there's a lot of media that's putting out fabricated lies. <laughs> and so we really want this, um, we want to succeed. And so, um, if you could help in, in any way, that, that would be fantastic. Awesome. We come together as one. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to take off? I am, right. yes. Thank you so Thank much you. For, you. Yeah. for coming. Thank you. Thank you yes. so much. I appreciate it. All right. Um, so, some of the things that we wanted to make sure to cover every time <laughs> we talk about this. Um, yeah, what, what you're saying, don't, don't, don't fear monger. Like, we, we were on a, a thread where people were talking and a woman was like, well, I know I met somebody who's a fed and I, once I heard this was going on, I called him to see and he was saying people should, should leave for their own safety. Don't spread propaganda. Um, if it came from the, the police, if it came from the feds, if it came from, you know, and it, they're trying to get people to leave. So don't say, hey, it's scary. It's going to be really scary. You, you should leave for your own safety. People know that people know where they're going if they're going there they, they you know don't tell them not to go don't try and make them afraid to be there uh, because the the police and the authorities would really like people to go away and would like there to be people to be scared so don't be scared you know like I said there's there's elders right there on the line there's there's um, you know the, you you have no reason to be scared that's and also <laughs> yes. I mean if someone is deciding to go to a place like this it is, I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big deal in their life. And so mm -hmm. it's, I would say instead, honor, you know, if you have a friend or someone that's going there, honor that and tell them thank you. Tell them, you know, encourage them. Say you're going to pray for them or wish them well and say what can you do to help support them. Maybe, you know, the financial support, often people could use that, you know, to help them on a trip like that. So Yeah, but don't, don't naysay them. And, um, you know, if you hear things on, you know, the Morgan County Sheriff Facebook, they've been putting out, totally unconscionable lies um a DAPL person was uh, arrested by the Bureau of Indian Affairs after he came and, and tried to pose as a protector with an AK AR-15 I think not an AK an AR-15 and uh, they so he, he he tried to drive in with his truck with this gun so that he could with his bandana go pretend to be a protector so that it looked like they were armed so then they can use force right so th this is again attempted murder because he's trying to get the police to shoot these people um and he works for dapl his name is <laughs> uh, kyle thompson he um he came on and he they just they saw the gun they diverted his vehicle from the road he got out and he ran the people um followed him and some people you, you hear in the live feed people are, are yelling at him and other people shush them because they're using nonviolent techniques so you don't want to yell you don't have aggression they actually talked him down convinced him to give over his gun and he was arrested by Indian Affairs Martin County Sheriff said a man on the reservation with a gun was arrested they don't say it was a DAPL person they don't say it was the Bureau of Indian Affairs that arrested them they make it sound the opposite so they're, they're trying to spread that misinformation 
And also, um, again, the rumors, you know, um, if you're talking to somebody who says, I saw this with my eyes, or you see it on like a live feed and you physically see it happening and you, and, and not just that you see it, but that you understand what you're, you're looking at, you know, without assumptions. Well, I, I think this must be this camp, or I think if you don't know which camp it is, don't go around and tell people what camp it was. You know, if you don't know because you saw it or you, you know, it hasn't come directly from the horse's mouth, you know, um, somebody who was there, somebody who saw it, none of this, you know, well, I heard from somebody that heard from somebody that heard from somebody that might not be the, the real story. So, um, the gossip is, is crazy. Um, you know, I heard this and I heard this, um, try, try not to spread that stuff, uh, unless it's like firsthand stuff that you're talking about. And then I like to try and, um, illustrate, you know, like this is what I heard from this person or this source or, you know, when I was talking earlier about the person who was taken and everybody was wondering, and then I said, well, the third person who was there said, and so I'm being really clear with you guys, I didn't see this, but I talked to the person who was that third person, and that's where that information comes from. So, you know, really, really try and know where the information is coming from so we're not spreading rumors. Um, another thing that's really important right now is everybody wants to help, and so they're sending stuff. They're sending lots of stuff. People are like, I'm renting a U-Haul and I'm going to fill it with all everybody's donations and take it. So one of the first things, because uh, we brought stuff too, we're like, oh, they need food, they need, they need clothes, they need tents, they need, we collected all this stuff from all over and we, we brought it there and we get directed to the supply tents and the first thing we realize is, well, as we open it and we're like, oh, we have these donations and the people actually groaned. They were like, oh. The, the food supply tent is so full, there is no more room right now. And, and there will be a point where they will need more food donations, but right now, there's not enough places to store it. It's going into winter, the stuff is gonna get wrecked. Um, and it's really hard to manage the stuff you need when you have a bunch of extra stuff to deal with. Um, even more so with the stuff. There were eight canopies, big carport canopies full of stuff. Um, like, you know, here's the men's canopy, right? The coat's canopy, the women's canopy, the children's canopy, right? All these canopies of stuff. And then in front of each canopy, there's one or two small tents with that stuff in it. And then in front of those tents, there's piles of stuff kind of covered by tarps, but they don't even really have enough tarps to cover that extra stuff. So stop sending stuff. Um, you know, we brought a, a Sub-Zero sleeping bag and without knowing what we were doing, and you know, we're trying to help, we don't know what we're doing. So we dropped it off there and realized later that was not a very helpful thing to do. We should have found someone who needed a Sub-Zero sleeping bag and given it to them. So if you are bringing useful stuff like Sub-Zero sleeping bags, four season tents, um, you know, if you have that really nice wool coat or really good gloves or um, a hat, so again, that's in really nice condition and is able to handle below 20 weather, um, yeah, then bring that stuff, but find a person that needs it because once it goes into those piles of stuff It's it's you can't find the good stuff because there's so much useless stuff summer tents and shorts and t-shirts and people are it's like people are sending their goodwill bag. It's um, uh, One of the elders there at the meeting Johnny he said uh, we don't need 600 left boots and at this point a lot of stuff is a left boot um, so what they do need um, which you can also get the the most up-to-date uh, needs list on indigenousrising.org, also sacredstonecamp.org, I believe also has a super updated list. And you'll notice none of those say, you know, clothes or, you know, the, they're not asking for food right now. Like these things are just, they're without a place to store it, it becomes a liability, especially now they're trying to condense camps. Where does all this stuff go and who's going to move it there and how are they going to manage that? And right now there's, there's no one, everyone's, doing more functional things. They're, they're cooking food for people or they're standing at the front line. They, there's nobody who has the time to sit there and sort through piles and piles of clothes and sleeping bags to determine what is flimsy nylon and what is actually gonna be worn. So um, stop sending that stuff. Um, what they do need is uh, solar power equipment, generators, wood stoves, uh, wood stove parts, but Again, it's like it's got to fit the wood stove. So if you just send a bunch of random wood stove parts that might not fit the wood stoves they have, uh, it's way better to give them money because then they can go to Bismarck and buy the exact sizes and types and things they need. Um, uh, yeah, wood stoves with rocket mass heaters. These would be really great there, and, and nobody has any of them. I don't know if a lot of you know what these are. It's a super, um, super efficient wood-burning 
heat element that makes a large amount of heat with just little twigs and sticks. So those of you out there that know what a rocket mass heater is and you know how to make them out of propane tanks, they need those. <laughs> mm. um, also, if you have the skills, you can also make rocket mass heaters out of cinder blocks and uh, mud and stuff. So if you have those skills and you can go there right now, I didn't meet anybody there who knows how to build those. Um, if I could have stayed longer, I would have been building them and building them and building them. You know how to build them? Uh, in Enough. theory, yes. Yeah, I, I have not... I, I got the supplies together and started to make one, but then my heating needs changed and I didn't end up having to make it. But I did a lot of research and I, I feel like I could make one. Mm -hmm. But especially for those of you that have actually made them before and know how to make them, uh, you can make them out of 55-gallon um, drums, you can make them out of propane tanks, but basically it's a way to uh, superheat, charge, burn very small amounts of wood. So it's, it's like better than a wood stove with less exhaust and it takes less wood. So that would be super useful out there right now. Um, they need radios, like two-way FRS radios. They need batteries, uh, AA, AAA mostly for the radios and for other stuff. Um, if you have access to giant Arctic tents, those ones that, um, you know, they're, they're made for being in Antarctica or whatever, you know, they're made, they're, they're, um, and they're, they're huge. They're like football field size. So that people can put their tents and their kitchens inside. And again, that community where the, the camp then is in that tent and is warm and is um, all together. They really need, and so this is a big ask, but if there's somebody out there that has access to um, uh, shipping containers or semi-truck trailers. Right now they really need two to four semi-truck trailers or shipping containers so that they can put shower and bathroom blocks in them for the winter. Um, the porta potties that they use, um, which have been working great so far, and they, they're very clean um, and well maintained, uh, but they're going to freeze. And they, they, the elders were saying they don't really want to keep using them in the winter because you have to put antifreeze in them, and then that gets dumped and it just makes them more toxic. They're already kind of a little bit toxic, that makes them more toxic. Um, with the semi truck trailers or the shipping containers, they can build showers, um, they can have holding tanks, they can, you know, have toilets. Um, so that's really, really useful right now. If anybody out there has that ability to bring those, that would be great. Um, yeah, call the numbers, post bail if you can, donate money if you can, but more than that, like, um, do something, uh, do an action locally, go there and stand with them, make the calls, um, spread the word, tell people, um, not rumors, but actual information, uh, that you have verified. Um, we're going to be, Mallory and I are going to be doing some talks here locally. Um, we're going to try and set something up with the Heritage Center in Port Angeles um, to do something there. Um, we're going to get a, we have a sponsorship from um, Ichikawa that is going to let us use some of their space to do a presentation. Uh, this Thursday um, at the um, Boiler Room open mic at 7 o'clock. Um, it's a show that I host and this week it's going to be... All standing rock, not entirely. If people want to play music, that will be there too. But um, this is on my mind, and it's what I'm going to talk about. And we don't always have a lot of people signing up for that open mic. And so um, there's a lot of time for um, questions. If anybody wants to come ask questions, if anybody wants to come hear um, about our experiences, but most importantly, if they want to hear about um, this information about how to help uh, functionally, um, the information that uh, we are sharing came from Joy Braun, who is the, um, uh, the lead frontline organizer from Indigenous Environmental Network. Um, we also spoke to um, people at the media tent. Um, trying to remember who, who told me I can share their name and who said not to. Um, the guy from Legal who only wants to be known as Legal Noah. He doesn't want his actual name out there. Um, hey from media, um, just first name. Um, Warriors on the front line did not want to share their names, but they had a lot of good information for us. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anyone. Oh, and, and Johnny and a few other elders. Um, and the sixth generation grandson of Sitting Bull, and his name is very complicated. <laughs> Same name as Sitting Bull's father's name, and without looking it up, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tear it apart. But <laughs> yeah. um, that's where this information is coming from, is mostly from these people and then and asking around in the camps, but these are where most of our definitive information is coming from. Mm. Sorry, I'm very no, <laughs> I don't it's, mean to... <laughs> it's great. Um, thank you so much for coming here, sharing this information, but thank you most of all for going it. there. I and know. it's uh, it is absolutely awesome, inspiring. And uh, it's what everyone needs to do. 
thousands. Yeah, the action is awesome and inspiring. I, I feel like I don't actually want to be thanked because I feel like I left right before I was most needed. So, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> we were we were just um, a few hours outside when everything got shut down. We wanted to turn around and go back, and we couldn't because all the roads were shut. So, um, so go there, go help. That's 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 the thing to do. Minio Kony, <laughs> water is life. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much, anyone that tuned in. Feel free to share uh, the video and uh, share anything of uh, value, uh, frontline um, live feeds from Standing, Lock, Standing Rock's frontline. Mm -hmm. um, that share button is very powerful. It makes whatever you've seen in your social media feed go out to every one of your friends. It's a really way to make things go viral. Well, it doesn't, it, because the algorithm, it doesn't go to all of your friends. So share it, share it again, share it again. And they're pulling videos down. So the more you share it, the better chance that your friends are going to see it. Um, because, uh, they, there's, um, Facebook is very tied in with the people that would like the oil and gas industry to have free reign. And so they do like to like things will disappear. Videos that you post will disappear. So, um, you know, maybe people will get an annoyed that you keep share, share, sharing, but it's really the only way to get that algorithm to get it to all of your friends. Yeah. Um, and I hope we see you tonight at the vigil at uh, Point Hudson Beach, uh, 7 p.m. All right. All right. So uh, we'll wrap there. Thank you very much. And cut. But we're still rolling, so I have to like, turn it Oh, you have to actually yeah. press the button, so we're cutting. <laughs> so we are. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.